Hi guys, it's Ryan here with Sigma Survival and this video today is going to be a little bit of a follow up on the colour coding sort of video that we did on disaster preparedness. So stay tuned, it's going to be an interesting one. Okay guys, so we talked a little bit about the importance of colour coding and how you could essentially give yourself the means to pick something up in a high stress situation that you need for a very specific task or situation. So there was the red kit, the blue kit and there was also an orange kit. Okay, so I'm going to go over the red and the blue kit today because these are medical kits that are very, they're kind of specialised actually. Um, but they're pretty simple and easy to use by someone who isn't medically trained at all. So let's get into what's in them. So the red kit is the catastrophic hemorrhage kit. The reason why it's red is because it's the same colour as blood. It's like it's a, it's a mental sort of image that can help you remember. Anyway, let's get into what's inside and uh, let's see. Okay guys, so the red kit, the catastrophic hemorrhaging kit. This is one of the most important kits that there is because if you start bleeding, you need to stop that bleeding or you'll die. And it's crucial that you know how to use this kit first and foremost, but it's really not rocket science and there's videos coming up on how to use the individual pieces within. So all I have to do is unclip this. The first piece of kit in here is an improvised medical item. You won't find this in many medical kits, if any at all. It's basically just an elasticated band, uh, a workout band. It is a meter long, this one. The one that I carry on my person is two meters long because there's more uses with that. Um, but generally speaking, this is just used to tourniquet. It can also be used as a pressure dressing. Um, you could probably even use this as a pelvic binder on a child because it's only a metre long, whereas for an adult you'd want two metres um, to do that. So many different uses for this, other than just stopping bleeding. You know, you can even treat burns or fractures or a whole host of different things with this. Um, you can use it as a chest seal. So generally speaking, it's a multi-purpose, multi-tool for loads of different medical issues that are trauma related. Next to that is the gloves, so if you have to do anything icky like packing a wound full of gauze, you want gloves on really. You know, if you've got time, put them on first, but people's lives are on, on the line when it comes to bleeding, especially in a remote and austere setting where help isn't coming. You know, you need to stop that bleeding first. Speaking of wound packing, I've just got some standard bandages. This is also good for, for mild to moderate bleeding. We want to control that as well because blood is precious, you've got cells in the blood that you cannot get back. We want to preserve that as much as possible. Um, so even mild, mild to moderate bleeding can be deemed life-threatening in a, in a bad situation where you know you can't get extended help you know, um, at a hospital or an ambulance. Most importantly, a blood transfusion really, guys. We can't put back the blood that we didn't stop from coming out, so gauze to pack into the wounds. You could then use this as a pressure dressing on top of that, or you could tourniquet pack, undo the tourniquet and use this as a pressure dressing. Another item, oh, there's two items that have come out now, is vet wrap. We do have a dog in the family. Um, this stuff is super important for him, but also you can use this on yourself and this is great. I've just flat packed it in the middle, bit of super glue to hold it together and voila it's good to go an amazing pressure dressing and i dare say it stretches tight enough that you could potentially tourniquet a limb with this second item here hemostatic forceps guys this is this is just one that you don't want to be without even if you're untrained really if you're not comfortable using them then don't you'll find these a lot in fishing kits if you're trying to scavenge this in um in a shtf type scenario but generally speaking, this is an item that you don't want to be without. This is for clamping off blood vessels that you can visually see. So if you can visually see that blood vessel pulsating that blood, you can just come up and just clamp it off. And that's it. Like, you know, you've controlled that bleeding temporarily. 
Then we've got a generic trauma dressing. It's large, 15 by 18 centimeters. This has got an elasticated bandage and um, like an absorbent pad. You really want to be sort of using this sparingly if only if you really have to because it's a sealed sterile dressing whereas the other things here maybe aren't as sterile especially if water gets into the bag or something like that and then obviously you know there's no good it's no good stopping the bleeding and then having the patient die of hypothermia because you know they're in hypovolemic shock we want to be able to promote clotting and to do that we need to be able to keep them warm so this is basically just a Mylar survival shelter. I believe it can go all the way up towards like tent size, but this would be great for getting two people into it um, to keep the patient warm. So, you know, the patient and the second person, or if that's yourself or someone else, and then that body heat will work sort of as the heater and the patient can get warm easier. That's it in a nutshell, guys, that will stop more than one injury I would say. You can definitely deal with a very serious injury with just what's in this kit alone. And then maybe some some more than just one as well. But yeah, so this is the first step. In every kind of disaster scenario, we wanna be thinking about trauma because this is the time when people are gonna die unnecessarily because you don't have the kit on hand to be able to occlude that that blood flow down the arm to put a pressure dressing on to clamp off a blood vessel just just to give you enough time to let it clot on its own or to to get to further help it could be that help is 48 hours away what are you going to do in the meantime when someone's femoral artery is nicked you need to be able to treat it guys and this kit right here will do that regardless of the situation radiation flooding volcanic eruption, avalanche, whatever the situation is, economic collapse, EMP, you want to have a kit like this ready, readily available in a colour-coded system so that you can pick it up and go. And be familiar with what's in the kit and the layout as well. Anyway, let's get on to the Proctoclysis kit, the blue bag. Proctoclysis, for those of you that don't know, is rectal rehydration. Anyone that's watched some Bear Grylls will also know what Proctoclysis is. Now, hear me out, I know this is a taboo subject, I know that it gets, it probably will get some stick and it probably will get some criticism. It's an awesome alternative to IV therapies. It's combat proven to save combat casualties in two world wars. Yeah, before IV guys, and when IV wasn't available, this was the go-to means. It's still used today, you just don't hear about it a lot in remote settings. You can get a lot of things, a lot of benefit from rectal therapies. You can infuse medicines, you can infuse fluids if it's done in the right way, which will go into the blood plasma quicker than what any sort of oral intake will. Now, the only other thing that's quicker is either IV or intraosseous, and you know that won't necessarily be an option, especially for the common man with no medical training, even medically trained individuals who have got the kit available they'll only have limited amounts of that kit so you need to be thinking about these things guys this is a great backup it's a sustainable kit you know the bits can be reused because it's not a sterile procedure you could just disinfect things we can treat a, a whole range of things without ever putting a needle anywhere near someone and you know there's complications to that in some circumstances and we don't really want to be putting together IV fluids in a, a survival situation there's so many things that could go wrong. It has been done, but you know, let's just stick to something basic that everyone can do, not just trained medics. This kit stays packed in the same way all the time. I might intermittently just do like sort of like um, a check of the kit just to make sure that everything's still serviceable. Anything that looks like it's getting a bit old or frayed or anything that's out of date because there are medicines in here. I just swap them out with, with something that's fresh. You know, IVs aren't always gonna be the go-to. So let's have a look at what's inside. So rectal rehydration in itself requires some specific types of kit. I've actually wrote a guidebook on how to use this kit. The guidebook is actually printed in leaflet format 
for my use um, in this kit. This has roughly, I believe it's around about 30 pages long, but this has got everything that you need information wise. It's even got little pictures. It's got everything from how to put the kits together, to how to make the fluids, to how to test for dehydration, how to assess trauma patients to gauge how much you need, how to work out um, dosages and formulas. So let's say the Parkland formula for, for burn resuscitation. I've got all the references, there's case studies in here, interesting facts, it's everything you need to know in a couple of pages, condensed down. It's a resource in itself, you know, information is power in these situations. So to begin with, like, we need to look at the specifics of what we actually need. So these bags here are actually, are actually for measuring. So this bag here is a three litre capacity bag. This bag here is one litres. So basically, what does that mean? That means that on the fly, I can measure out the exact amount of fluid that I need to mix with the amount of sugar, salt, um, rehydration salts, medicines, to be able to put back into the patient. And all of that information is within this, this guide here. So these are, instead of having measuring jugs, these are our mixing bowls. So we have to keep these very safe. This is no particular order as well guys, I'm just showing different bits of kit that are inside um, because basically that's sort of the easiest way to do it for now. So here we've got medicines, okay, so we're going to be putting fluids into someone's backside. There is obviously something that can come from that and that is gas, bloating potentially if air gets in there. But also, people can have a faecal evacuation. So what we don't want is for people to be passing stalls at this point unnecessarily. So potentially, we might want to consider a melt-in-the-mouth Imodium um, just to stop that patient from having an accident or discharge of faeces. You know, it's just going to make everything a lot harder and you're going to lose out on precious fluids and salts. A lot of medications can be given rectally, so aspirin and paracetamol are in here. Uh, these are dispersible. Uh, these ones aren't, I believe, but they're capsules, so they can be broken open and poured into the, into the fluid and mixed in. So medicines are also viable for rectal uh, infusion. Just bear that in mind. Okay, guys, so the means of getting the fluids into someone... There's a few different bits of kit in here. Obviously there's gloves there to assist with that. But there's basically an endotracheal tube here. I believe it is a size, bear with me. I don't even know what size it is guys, but the packaging is somewhere. I believe it's, it's a CH16, so I'm not even sure. A lot of nurses out there will see that it's green and they'll know exactly what it is from that. Now you don't have to keep it in the packaging for this because it's um it's a non-sterile procedure. You know, we're putting stuff into an area where there's poo. So, I mean, it, you don't need to put a sterile tube in. Just make sure there's nothing in the tube first. Maybe give it a flush before you put it in, especially to get the air out as well. Uh, lubrication, no explanation needed for that. And there's a, a larger tube of it um, not just like small sachets and that's because we might want to keep reapplying the tube you know we might have to repurpose this tube on multiple patients in a survival situation I know it sounds gross but you know if we're limited on resources we've got to do what we've got to do there's um, a 60 mil feeding syringe here uh, so it's specifically for these endogastric or nasogastric tubes it's 60 mils, I don't know if I just said that. And basically, you know, this is a, an easy way to get the fluids in so we can put the fluids into the bags here to measure it out, mix in the solution that we need. A bit like an IV. Um, basically just feed in and out as much as we, we need to or have to, okay? 
Now, in order to make this work, in order to make the fluids get into the blood plasma, you have to pass the rectal wall and you have to transfuse it past the colon and the, the rectal area. Now, in order to do that, you need sugar. So here I've got just typical table sugar. Not always the first choice because it's not exactly good for you, but it's glucose. Okay, so this is also great for also administering certain medicines. But generally speaking, we always want to be adding glucose to the mix, okay? Not too much, but, you know, a, a steady amount. It's all in the guide. Okay, there's also rehydration salts here. Now, there is a case study where this was the only thing that was used. However, other case studies that I've referenced in there, in the guide, also show that you need to utilise glucose. So... You know, I've put glucose in there just to be on the safe side. It's also a, a, a form of electrolyte to an extent, as long as you don't overuse it. Um, rehydration salts here, you can use up to two at a time if you want a hypertonic solution, which is going to be extra hydrating. But generally, you just put one in to, I believe, 500 mils. So these ones here are just for rapid access. So if I, if I was doing a litre of fluid and I needed it fast, I could just tear two of these open and just infuse that without having to mess around with opening the other kits that I've got. So here is electrolyte powder. This has got 100 servings, okay? Um, sodium chloride, potassium sulfate, calcium hydrogen phosphate and hydrous, <laughs> magnesium oxide, okay? So it's got all of your core electrolytes in there. This is long term, this is short term. Okay, another form of sugar in there, which could also be used as lubricant, is honey. This will help to get them fluids into the blood plasma. It's a, in a plastic squeezy bottle, perfect for what we need it for. You can also use this for a, a plethora of other medical interventions like wound care and whatnot. Oh, there's the other aspirin. I believe that's just come undone. We'll have to change that out now, the Imodium. Hand gel, just for hygiene purposes, and the gloves, obviously. And here's just a triangular bandage, okay? It looks random, but it's there just for, for cleaning up spillages, potentially, because we can reuse that cloth if we wash it adequately. Um, it's also there for, for dignity, guys, just to cover the patient over. You know, their bum and genitals are potentially going to be exposed when we're doing this procedure. And it's an extra layer so it can keep them a bit warmer. So that, in a nutshell, is the, the proctoclysis kit, guys. This will save someone's life, hands down. If someone's lost fluids for whatever reason, which is quite viable, um, this is what we want to be using. Because IVs are, are more technical. They're, there's a risk of, of complications, especially if you're not trained. You can't take the person to a hospital setting. And this was used... This in itself, it's not an enema, but it's similar. This was used in two world wars, okay? It's still used in remote settings to this day, and it has been proven to save people's lives when they've suffered massive hemorrhaging. Um, I wouldn't want to be without this kit, but yet I've seen nobody else with a kit like this. Could I be the first person to do this? Potentially. Anyway, um, let me put all this away and we'll just have a chat, just to follow up everything that we've just spoken about. Okay guys, so one thing I forgot to mention was that in this kit here, there's only one tube, okay? Now, this is something that I've factored in more recently. These tubes cost hardly anything. They're uh, nasogastric or endogastric tubes. They're basically fed through the nose into the stomach. These are a very common disposable, but still sort of long-term item that are used by patients in a hospital setting. So... If you've got multiple people in your immediate sort of group, family, friends, count how many people you've got in that group and maybe, you know, make sure that you've got at least enough of these tubes to, to use on half of those people. So that's just something that is worth thinking about because you don't want to have only one kit and one means of getting the fluids into people. You want to have multiple tubes you know, maybe even an extra syringe. So 
you can actually get this into to multiple survivors in any sort of situation because you don't want to be you know having to chop and change between people it's not sanitary but also time is of the essence you need to get fluids into people fast so that was just another point that I forgot to make and wanted to just put in there so that's it guys um, for proctoclysis and for catastrophic hemorrhaging um, the kits and the colour coded kits that I've got um, there is another video coming up on the radiological sort of survival kit that I've got. That's all about protecting the body against radioactive isotopes. That's going to be a great video. Um, a lot of research has gone into that also, leading up to sort of creating these videos and whatnot. I don't know anybody else that has got a kit like this. I don't know many people who are talking about it, if any. The only other survival instructor or survivalist I've heard talk about it is Bear Grylls on TV. Um, that's where I learned about it actually. So there's not many people talking about this, there's not many people doing this. Um, I highly recommend that you start looking into this because the world is very, very fragile at the moment. There's so many different things that could happen. Um, you know, everything from ambulances not being able to turn up here in the UK on time to, you know, the threat of nuclear war you know, there's just so many factors where this could be useful. You know, if there's a world war, it might be that medics start using this again. So videos like this one and kits like this might become, you know, a golden resource for, for you know, future medics and people who are sort of in those situations. Yeah. That's it really, guys. One thing I will note is that the hemostatic forceps, you know, you might want to get some advanced medical training on how to use those or just keep them aside for if somebody with medical training can come along and use those but generally speaking everything in these kits is easy to use it's practical for the average person with no medical training to be able to, to give life-saving care in the field we've got more videos coming up um, I've got some follow-up videos for this video so I'm going to show you how you would work with the proctoclysis kit how you would work with the red kit um, and basically do some practical examples of the kit inside but uh, yeah and obviously we've got the orange kit coming up too anyway guys I don't want to talk your ear off too much um, thank you for watching I really hope you like these kits please do drop me a comment and let me see what you think of this sort of stuff very very interested to hear what you have to say